Recently, we went out to take some photos for our new office space. We're making some wall art. So we wanted to get photos of the Phoenix area and kind of get that Arizona landscape as well as some of the city. So we went kind of all over, spent a day taking a bunch of photos. Didn't do a lot of video for this, you know, film some behind the scenes stuff. But most of it was focused on getting some really nice photos and we had scouted a little bit online you know kind of looked at some cool places to go with a bunch of cactus and just kind of nice desert landscape so we drove around and picked up some of these spots and it was a lot of fun it was incredibly hot probably would have been better to do this come fall or winter but you know middle of the summer why not let's go out and sweat a little bit it's good and a lot of this so we had uh, one 5d uh, Mark III, which is what David was filming with, and then I was shooting with the GH4. Now, the GH4, as you know, is not as high resolution as the 5D and not as nice of a sensor, being smaller micro four third sensor as compared to the full frame in the 5D. So, David was doing it as well, but I really wanted to make sure that everything I was doing with the GH4, I was doing panoramas. So we had that extra resolution to play with so that we'd be getting a better quality print out of it as compared to just the 16 megapixel sensor on the GH4. We're making some pretty big photo prints from this, so we I really wanted to make sure we got the best resolution possible. Hence why we're shooting with the 5D Mark III, doing photos, uh, doing panoramas with that as well, but then also doing the gh 4 just so we could maximize our time. And, you know, after everything, I really got to say the gh 4 did a great job holding up. Not as nice as the 5D Mark III in terms of photo quality. The 5D Mark III is a great camera for taking photos, but the gh 4 uh, can hold its own if you're doing some stuff like panoramas. And even for candids and, and snapshots, the gh 4 is pretty good. But as a, as a general photography camera, I probably wouldn't recommend it as your main thing. Panasonic has done a good job making a nice hybrid, but with that, they've kind of, you know, they have to sacrifice a little bit on the photo side to make the video as good as it is, which the video on the GH4 is much better than the video on the 5D Mark III. Anyways, that's beside the point. The one thing I wanted to say, and just hopefully you can get a tip from this, I guess, is that when you're shooting panoramas, you you want to shoot with a longer focal length, and that might not uh, be the most intuitive thing, but what happens when you shoot it with a wider focal length and you stitch those images together is you end up with a lot more distortion. You get kind of a, a bubbling effect, and it looks more like a fisheye lens would rather than if you take... Uh, photos with like a, a longer focal length. So on the GH4, sometimes I had to shoot a little bit wider. Uh, I was using the 12 to 35 uh, Panasonic lens. And even at the long end at 35, that was kind of right at the start of where you'd want to start with those longer focal lengths. So Keep that in mind when you're shooting panoramas, you'll find it much more pleasing, I think, in terms of aesthetics uh, in the final result if you shoot with a longer focal length. And obviously that depends on the sensor size of your camera. So with the GH4, uh, 35 millimeters, you know, with the crop factor, that's essentially a 70 millimeter lens on the 5D. If you shot with a 35 millimeter lens on the 5D, you would see that distortion and kind of that fisheye effect on the panorama. And you know, it is kind of cool. Try it out. Maybe it's a look you like, but me personally, I tend to like the more flatter images for the panoramas. And another thing I'll let you know is that uh, Lightroom, in the most recent version, they added a new feature. I guess it's not really a new feature, but they implemented it right in Lightroom. On previous versions of Lightroom, you had to send your images to Photoshop to stitch them together into a panorama, which worked great and it wasn't necessarily a problem, but it's just kind of a nuisance having to go into another application just for stitching the panorama. Now on the most recent version of Lightroom, they've updated it to where you can stitch the panorama right in Lightroom. You just select the images, you right click, photo merge into a panorama. It's really easy. You can also do the same thing with HDR images. If you take multiple exposures, you can merge them right in Lightroom and get all that control right there. It's really nice, really helpful to do it in the native software app. The one thing I did run into though, is that if Lightroom, you say you put you know 10 images into your panorama and Lightroom doesn't know where to put two of the images. It you know has a little bit of a glitch in the system where it's not sure what to do with them it will actually force inject them into the panorama. So if you give it 10 images, it will use all 10 images. And it's kind of funny what it does is it actually photo stitches them it, like the other images into weird and awkward places into the photo. And it can actually make for a kind of cool effect, not anything we were going for because someone who looked at it on the wall would be like, man, they really messed up that panorama. 
But if you do the same thing in Photoshop, what Photoshop will do is they'll say, hey, those two images, couldn't figure out where to put them, and it just kind of sets them aside in the uh, whole composition and in your layer. So you'll have those two images set aside. So what I ended up doing was, because Lightroom wasn't working and it was force injecting these images into a panorama, it didn't need to be there, I tried it in Photoshop and sure enough, Photoshop said, yeah, these two images, I don't know where to put them. So I just set them aside. Well, I took those two, I went back to Lightroom, removed those two images from the set that I was trying to merge. So I went from 10 down to just eight photos and then it worked perfectly. So all you gotta do is figure out which two photos Lightroom is having issues with, remove them, and then you should be fine. The way I shot the panorama, I had plenty of overlap, so I didn't need any of the information that were in those images anyway. So it ended up working out and I was able to do the editing and everything to the raw data right in Lightroom without having to go through Photoshop and mess around with exporting a TIFF and all that that kind of nonsense. So it was really nice to be able to stay in Lightroom, but definitely watch out for that. At first, I didn't even notice because Lightroom did such a good job. It just kind of looked like it looked like a panorama, and then I started paying attention. I was like, wait, that that building's not there. That's not supposed to be there. What? What the heck's going on? And yep, sure enough, it stitched it together in a weird way. So just keep that in the mind next time you're doing panorama work. It'll save you a lot of time and hassle if you can do it all right in Lightroom. And then what I like to do is I do all my editing right in Lightroom, get all my color, everything dialed in, and then for any fine tuning or tweaking or uh, advanced image manipulation, then I take that exported TIFF into Photoshop to do some kind of, you know, if I need to paint something out or remove something, I'll do that in Photoshop. But for the basic fundamental groundwork, I do that all in Lightroom.